As I said earlier, you're joining us at the wrapping up of a message series that we've called All In, where we're making the challenge, man, of cashing all our chips in. You know, and I know that for some, that looks different. You know, you might have an image or a, or a picture of what it looks like to go all in. We talked about in the very first week that we've got a few couples in our church that are getting ready to tie the knot. Amen? I mean, they're like, when you all agree, that's, that's kind of going all in, right? When you say, I do. Amen? Right? Some of y'all clapping back there like, okay, man, I don't know if you're clapping because, you know, for us guys, we're like, okay, should I or shouldn't I? You know, do I or do I not? You know? That's a big. Some of y'all, we talked about, you know, you're coming up to this cliff and you're going to jump off this cliff off into the ocean. That's kind of commitment, right? I mean, when you say, I mean, if you got up there on the Empire State Building, just decided to jump off and kind of midair, you kind of realize, okay, I'm all in now, right? This is, this is pretty much it, right? I mean, you can't go back once you jump off, amen? So there's all sorts of different images that we talked about. So we've been looking at what would it look like in your life? What would it look like in our life if we went all in for God? If we just pushed our chips in and said, you know what? It all belongs to you and we're going to go all in. What does that look like? Maybe you're a student. What does it look like for you to go all in for Christ today? What does that look like for you? Maybe you're married. Maybe you've never done this church thing before. Maybe you're kind of, you know, feeling the waters out. And yet it's okay, you're welcome to be here. What would it look like for you to go all in? What would it look like for you to go all in at your job? Or maybe as a parent, as a father, what would it look like for you to go all in as a dad? You know, letting God lead and guide you, or a mom, right? There's so many different definitions we can look at, man. We all have that place in our life, and we're all going to see, if we're going to see today, we all get to come to a place in our life where you're going to be asked in your life, are you willing to go all in? I know I have. We all have. So we've been looking at this phrase. This is the phrase we've been looking at. It's actually from an old pastor that caused a revival that happened a long time ago, D.L. Moody. And he said this. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a person that's fully surrendered to him. Can you imagine with me for just a moment? This is what we talk about all throughout the last month. Is what would it look like for you to go all in for God? See, here's the thing. We haven't seen that type of person yet. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but we have yet to see what God can do to a person who's fully surrendered to him. We've looked at this scripture. This has been our key scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is fully devoted to him or loyal to him, whose heart is loyal to him. You understand that God is looking for you. That's what we talked about at the beginning of the message, right? right? Going through this whole thing. This is what I want you to get. God is looking for you. Well, Pastor Mike, how can you say that? Because he's looking for someone whose heart is loyal to him. He doesn't care about what you look like. He doesn't care about your talent. He doesn't care how smart you think you might be. He is looking for someone who's just willing to get to the place in their life to go, you know what? I'm going to go all in. I'm going to push all my chips to the front. And I know my friends might disown me. I know people might think I'm a little crazy, but I'm pushing it all in to go for it. God is looking for a man or woman who's willing to do that. The question is, are they in this room? That's the question. Are they in this room this morning? Right? See, here's the thing I think we need to get understanding. When we became Christian, and somewhere, somewhere along the line of this Christianity, especially within America, we got kind of this mis- uh, this bad thinking of what Christianity is, is about. When did we start believing that God wants to send us to a safe place to do easy things? That playing it safe is safe. That radical is anything but normal. See, Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. I said he died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan, it's a daring plan. And the complete surrender of you and my life to the cause of Christ isn't radical, it should be normal. Do you hear me? That should be normal living. It's time to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. You know what I'm saying? I mean, think about it like this. We only get one life to live. Why not live it dangerously for God? And cash and all. Once you get, once this life, there isn't a second part of this life that you go, okay, well, I get part two. I've got a lot of, a lot of feedback here, uh, sound guy. It reminds me of a guy, man, that uh, I like all types of music. How many of y'all like a variety of music? Come on, man, let's be honest. How many of y'all like, okay, I'm going to throw it out there, guys. Don't check out on me, please. All right, how about classical music? Anybody, any, anybody like, got a couple guys back here. I love classical music. And some of y'all didn't know, man, uh, here's Pastor Mike coming out of the closet. Not what you think. 
but I like to paint. I paint at home. I have a, some of y'all been to my house and uh, I've got a, a, a room that Robin calls her office, but I call it my studio and we kind of fight sometimes about that. Um, but I have a studio and I have a big easel and, and, I, and I love to paint. But when I paint, I like to listen to classical music, okay? All right. Yes, I ride a Harley. Yes, I got tattoos. And yes, I like to listen to classical music. I like to listen to a guy named Bach. Has anybody heard of a guy named Bach? Interesting story about that. I don't have time to talk about it, but some of you might be checking out on me going, uh-uh, time out, man. This isn't the church that I thought you were going to be. You're talking about this classical music. Well, before you check out on me, brother, let me tell you something. You've heard Bach or even listened to it if you've ever been to a wedding. Huh? The wedding song? Huh? That's Bach. He did that. What's interesting about this guy and the why I bring him up is because he did something about every part of his music. There's a phrase that says, soli dio gloria. And every song that Bach wrote, he wrote the letters FDG representing that phrase, soli dio gloria, on the bottom of each page. It meant, watch this, the glory of God alone, or to the glory of God alone in every song that he ever written. You can pull up his old manuscripts and look at the bottom of the last page of his song and you'll see the words S-D-G. See, in our world today, especially when we're going to go all in, it's not about what we do, but watch this, but why we are doing it. Matter of fact, write this down. It's a phrase that they just pulled up. It's not about what you do. It's about why you do what you do. It's the motivation behind what you're doing. It's the motivation behind why you're going to be a good father, why you're going to be a good mother, why you're going to be a good son or daughter, why are you going to be a good follower of Christ. There is a motivation. What is the motivation? I'm hoping it would be like Bach where you can write on the bottom of your life, FDG, Soli Dio Gloria, to God, the glory of God alone. And it's ultimately, it's who you do it for. Jesus said it like this in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. He says, And he said unto all, If any man or woman would come after me, let him, watch this, deny himself, take up his cross weekly, monthly, yearly, only on Christmas, Easter Sunday, and follow me. No, he said daily, didn't he? It goes on to say, for whoever would save his life shall lose it, but whoever shall lose his life for my sake, this is Jesus talking, the same shall save it. And he wraps up the thing, says, for what does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his own soul? Jesus challenged, made many challenges like this within Scripture. One time he even said this, the multitude of people were following him. Check this out. Can you imagine this? Put yourself in that place. He's, he's got all these folks, right, hanging out with him, right? And he stops. He turns to them and he says this. He says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I'm gone. Have a nice life. Right? I mean, he turns out, I mean, you would think that a guy, that's not very politically correct in our world today, right? You don't kind of say that. It's kind of gross, right? It's like, Jesus, what are you trying to do? I thought we were trying to get followers. He said, I am. I'm trying to get true followers. True followers. Another time, he even took back to the same multitude of group of people. Apparently, they like punishment. I don't know. But he looks back at Jesus, looks back at him again, and he says, look, if you're not willing to leave your father or your mother, your brother, your sister... Bring all your kinfolk, leave them all behind. You're not worthy of following in the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean that you literally leave your children and leave your marriage and leave all that. What he was saying was he was setting a precedent for us to go all in. He said, he has to be the Lord. Your marriage can't be the Lord over Jesus. Your children, I know they're cute. I know they're cuddly. I know, man, that you got the cutest child on Facebook. I get it. But the Bible says, man, that you've got to be willing not to put them above Jesus, man. You've got to go all in for him. It might be your job. It might be whatever, man. There might be things in your life that you say, man, you would never, it would be this and then God. And God says, no, 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 that's not how it works. You're either going to go all in or you're not going all in. And we all got that stuff, amen? We all got stuff that the Lord's dealing with. This was Jesus' ultimate challenge to go all in. And we find it again in the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, whatever you do, this is out of the Amplified, no matter what it is, look to your neighbor and say, no matter what. Come on, play along, no matter what. 
And whatever you do, no matter what, in word or deed, do everything, say everything, everything. in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon him, his person. Watch this. Giving praise to God the Father through him. See, he leaves everything on the table. And he says, man, there's nothing that can take precedence. So no matter what you do, if you're a garbage man, be the best garbage man anointed by the Holy Spirit and do it for the glory of God. If you're a teacher, teach with the glory of God. If you're a father, be a father to the glory of God. And on and on and on we can do this. We don't have excuse. Book of Colossians tells us whatever you do, go all in. Not for you or for personal gain, right? But for eternal gain is what we're all after. Amen. Y'all keeping up with me? Amen. See, in God's kingdom, it's our mo motivations that matter most. If you do the right thing for the wrong reason, it doesn't even count. God judges the motives of our hearts. And the only reward, and he only rewards those who do the right thing for the right reason. And to be perfectly honest, I think back over my life, I missed out on a lot of rewards because I might have done the right thing, but in my life, I did it for the wrong, with the wrong motivation. And probably if we looked at all of our life, man, I mean, we all can say, hey, man, I'm with you, Pastor Mike. I get this. I'm with you on this. What is the motivation? Reminds me of a story of a guy named David. Some of you might have heard about this cat. David's in the Old Testament. He was king over Israel. But before he became king, in God's search for a new king, there was a guy named Saul that was a king. And Saul, man, turned wicked. He kind of went against God. And so God says to Saul, man, I can't trust this dude no more. I need a new king. And so he goes out searching. And then back in those times, they would talk through prophets. And so they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Bible. So what God would do is he'd speak to a man that was called a prophet. And that prophet would go out and he would speak to the people. So he, at the time, it was a guy named Samuel. Samuel was the prophet. And God told Samuel, hey, go to this cat named Jesse's house. And at Jesse's house, he's got six boys, right? And he says, in those boys is my new king. So, man, he goes to Jesse's house. Jesse comes out. He hears that the prophet Samuel shows up. He says, hey, God has spoken to me. He says, the king lives at this house. And Samuel's like, you know, Jesse's like, whoop, whoop. You know, life is going to change for us. It's all for the good. So he gets all of his boys. Well, almost all of them. And he lines them up before Samuel. Samuel goes to the oldest one. He's the good-looking dude, right? He wasn't the short dude. That guy was out there in the field, right? He was good-looking, educated, smart, you know, tall. And I don't know what the tall, dark, and handsome thing has to do with anything. I don't believe in all that. <laughs> right? <laughs> tall. And so Samuel comes up to this, the oldest son, and he's thinking in his heart. Watch this. He's thinking, surely... This guy is going to be king. I mean, just look at him. And God checks Samuel. And watch what he says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height. I want you all to remember that. Highlight that. Of his stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, it's really about living for the audience of one and not the audience of many. We can kind of live this life in our culture that says, man, we got to live for everybody else. And God says, no, 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 you're missing it. You don't live for everybody else. You live for me and me alone. It's the living for an audience of one. Now, I know that by saying this, some of you um, are here are going to begin to struggle. I already know it because you're already checking out on me. Because too many times in the church, when we hear a statement like this, we instantly begin to do the inventory of our lives. And we think, this is going to be about what you're going to have to give up. What do I got to let go of? And here's what we miss about statements like this. And this is why I love Epic Life Church. And this is what I want you to grab a hold of this morning. And that is this. God is not trying to take something from you. God is trying to get something to you. He's got something so much bigger, man, that if you'll just let go, God can do more with what he has than what you have and what you think you can do with it. Amen? Amen. So how do we do this? How do we get to a lifestyle where, man, we're going to go all in? Well, number one in your notes, man, is pursue the all in all and the rest gets forgotten. 
Pursue the all in all and all, everything else gets forgotten. If you'll just put your focus on what God wants you to do and begin to focus on him. Uh, some people in here today are wearing uh, these shirts that have in pursuit on, right? And it's just going in pursuit with him. Really need to fix this, guys. In pursuit. We're going in pursuit with our Heavenly Father. We're pursuing Him above everything else. Because when you do that, what happens is everything in the, everything else gets forgotten. And what matters most is what you'll begin to focus in on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we think that we think what matters most is our job. And God says, if you'll pursue me, I'll show you what really matters when it comes to finances. See, we think our job is our source. Our job is not our source. God is our source. Our job is simply the means that God uses to bless you. That's it. We, so we get bent up and, 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 and all twisted up about finances and all this other stuff. God says, wait, 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 wait. You're missing it. It's not about the job. It's not about the job. So we miss, miss SDG living is about doing the right thing for the right reasons. It's living for the nail-scarred applause of nail-scarred hands. You go all in and you go all out because Jesus Christ is your all in all. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. It's saying whatever, but not in a dis disrespectful way. You know, back in, have, you, have your kids ever looked at you and just went, whatever? Come, Y'all don't have those ch children, do you? Where are they at? Where? I, I knew. I, I was looking. Look at, look at it. They're, like, they're all pointing them out, praise the Lord. Like, Martins are never going to come back to church again, man. But it's not saying it like that with an attitude, like whatever, right? It's not. It's not doing it in a disrespectful way. We've all done. You know, my wife is good at that. Matter of fact, when I've irritated her enough, and I'll say, hey, Rob, whatever. She just kind of gives me that whatever attitude that only she can do. And she roll her eyes, right? And I don't even see it and know she did it. And it's really her saying whatever. I know what she's doing. But it's not like that. Actually, it's exactly what Jesus did. If you look at Luke 22, 41 through 42, watch this. And he withdrew from them but a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Watch this, church. Yet not my will, but always yours be done. He said, whatever. Whatever you want to do, God. When used in a submissive way, the word whatever is really a statement of absolute Surrender. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. This was Jesus' all-in moment. You have to understand, he had the power, the Bible says, he had the power to call down legions of angels and take him off the cross and whoop everybody's tail that was around him. He could have smoked him just like that, but he didn't. He said, whatever. Whatever your will is for this planet, God, that's what I want to do. See, he had that power and ability, yet he didn't use it. Isn't that amazing? It blows my mind he could have done that. Yet he went through the torture and the torment and the brokenness so that we can live the life that God has created us to live. A life in relationship with Jesus. Amen? He restored the brokenness of mankind back to the Father because Jesus was willing to go all in. And he didn't just count his chips. It counted his life. And he asked us to do the same thing in return. This is what real Christianity looks like. It's not about a denomination that you belong to or how many scriptures that you can memorize. It's the motivation in our hearts. It's the why behind everything that we do. It's the why behind our jobs, our parents, our lifestyles that we live, our neighborhoods and our communities. It's about living a lifestyle of all in. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33 says it like this. So then whether you eat or drink, watch this, whatever, look at your name and say, whatever, Whatever you may do, do all for the honor and the glory of God. Do not let yourselves be a hindrance by giving an offense to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Do not let others into sin, lead others into sin by your model of life. Just as I myself, this is Paul talking, strive to please. In other words, I am accommodating myself to the opinions, the desires, and the interests of others. I'm adapting myself to all men in everything that I do, not aiming at or considering my own profit and advantage, but because of that lifestyle, 
that of the many in order that they may be saved. What he was saying was, another translation says, I became all things to all men to save the least of these. It is all about going all in for Jesus. He said, look, when I'm with the poor, then I have a mindset of poor. It doesn't mean that he became poor. He said, when I, be, when I was with the religious folks, I had a mindset of religion. I didn't call myself better than them. I didn't act like I was better than them, whatever. I, I count, got on a level that they could understand. And that's what God wants us to do, is to get to a level, man, because everything that you and I do reflects the kingdom. And everything we do is to draw people to that kingdom. That's you and me. It's everything we do. Right? Sometimes I think we, we, get, we, we go, well, let's create a list and, and of do's and don'ts. And that's not what he's telling you to do. He says, whatever you do, do it all into my glory. I, t- I told my boys as they were growing up, and, and they would, you know, wrestle with who they're going to be or what job they're going to have or whatever. I said, it doesn't matter what you do as long as God is the underwriter of what you do. And as long as he's the underwriter of what you do, you won't have to worry about going in the wrong direction because you're, you're 100% bought in to what his will and purpose is for your life. You know, some people spend so much time worrying about this thing or that thing, and God says, man, forget all that stuff and just let me underwrite your life. Let me be the underwriter of your life. This is the ultimate whatever passage. Paul is using the daily rituals of eating and drinking to make an all-encompassing point. Even the most mundane of activities is absolute and can be absolute miraculous when God is all in with that. Look at why behind the whatever as they may be saved. The whatever is reaching people. Everything that you do is to reach people. The second note here is everywhere I go, I leave footprints. Everywhere I go, I leave a footprint. Did you ever think about that? You know what I mean? What's that footprint look like, though? What would happen if we considered what we left? Over the past month, we've been talking about our church, our city, our service. Each of those areas, not to mention your family, friends, community, and your job, you're leaving a footprint. But what is it saying about you? What does that look like? As a believer, you speak louder than the world by what you leave behind. People don't understand that sometimes. And that's sometimes why we have a hard time inviting others to church because they know what our lifestyle looks like Monday through Friday at work. And so it's hard for them to invite them in because we're really not all in at this point, right? So we live like a crazy man or a crazy woman out in the world, right? And then Sunday we want to come to church. And so that one, one hour a day week, man, we're putting all on there. But during the rest of the week, man, we're not really living that way. Because the footprint that we're leaving behind is not a good print. Maybe you're a negative person and people dread when you come to work. You're like, oh man, here they are. But you're, 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 a, you're, you're a kingdom daughter. You're a kingdom son. That's the footprint we should be leaving behind in every area of our life. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. It tells us like this. I love this because it's the love chapter. It says love suffers long. Is that the footprint you're leaving behind? It's kind. It doesn't envy. It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Uh Uh-oh. It's not seeking its own. It's not prideful. It's not provoked. Right? What else does it say? It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes in all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. What's the blueprint you're leaving behind? What's the footprint that you're leaving behind? But whatever there are prophecies, they will be failed. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there's knowledge, it will vanish away. What he's saying is all of these footprints that we're leaving behind are more important than your spiritual gifting. See, we believe in prophecies here. We believe in tongues here. We do all that stuff, right? We don't act weird about it, praise God, right? That's why you probably have been here a little while. It's like, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, we do, but we don't act weird. People are weird. God's not. Okay, amen. Right, but what he is saying, man, is that we're to live a life of love over those spiritual gifts because you can have all those spiritual gifts. You can look super spiritual on Sunday and go to work, man, and the people around you are dying and going to hell because you're leaving the wrong footprint. Pastor Mike, you're kind of getting in my business. A little bit. That's what I'm supposed to do sometimes, right? I'm supposed to get in your business a little bit. See, understanding the motivation behind our life will ultimately determine what we allow in our lives. It's like a guy named Moses, man, in the Old Testament. For 40 years, Moses felt like he had failed to accomplish his God-ordained dream of delivering the nation of Israel out of slavery. The prince of Egypt had all the potential uh, uh, in, in the world at the age of 40. But he felt like a lost cause at 80. Why? He lost everything when he lost his temper. He was both a felon and a fugitive. 
Instead of doing God's will, God's way, he took matters into his own hands. How many have all been there? And killed an Egyptian taskmaster. And by trying to ex- expedite God's will, he actually delayed it for four more decades. You see, God had a plan for Moses to lead the nation out of Israel. But God, or Moses decided, you know what? I think I can speed things up a little bit. I got my idea of how to do it. So what does he do? Well, we find it in Exodus chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. He looked this way and that way. This is Moses. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He went out the second day and saw two Hebrew men quarreling and fighting. And he said to the unjust aggressor, why are you striking your comrade? And the man said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Did you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he thought to slay Moses. But Moses had fled from Pharaoh's presence and took refuge in the land of Midian, where he sat down by a well. He ends up becoming a shepherd. He went from royalty to becoming a shepherd out in the middle of the desert somewhere because he tried to take matters in his own hands instead of trusting his heavenly father and going all in with God's purpose for his life. No matter how long it takes, it's what you're doing during that waiting period. At some point in our lives, most of us are going to feel like our life has passed us by. Our dream seems like a lost cause and our reality doesn't measure up to our identity. That crisis presents us with a choice. Throw in the towel once and for all, be done with it, or throw your hat back in the ring and go another round. Push all our chips in and keep playing the hand we have. See, here's the thing that I tell people in counseling. We've all been dealt kind of this. We just got done having our men's poker night on uh, Friday night. It was great. And you don't get to control what cards you receive. Some of you men are living a life, man, that's just been jacked up because you've been dealt with this, this, this set of cards. And you think, man, if I just turn all my cards over, no, you don't get to do that. You can push your chips in, but you got to keep your cards. But you can still win the game by how you play those cards. And everyone in this room has been dealt with a, 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 a deal. And some of it's bad, and some of y'all got a good deal, man. But you still have the choice in how you're going to play each one of those cards. What card will you lay down? I'm preaching better y'all. Amen. Y'all quiet this morning. (laughs) All of us here need to know that going all in for God isn't something you do once. In fact, you'll probably have to do at faith a few failures before you get it right. Moses did. David did. Peter did. I have. (laughs) Boy, have I. But one thing I've learned is that our failure is the fertilizer that grows our character. And character sustains success so it doesn't backfire. Success without any failure is like a plant without any roots or a building without any foundation. Failure, listen to me, failure is the substructure that supports the superstructure of success. The reason I put that down there is I used to build bridges and work on bridges. And it doesn't matter what the riding surface looks like. If the substructure of that bridge isn't correct and isn't solid, man, you can put, it doesn't matter how pretty the top surface of that bridge looks like, it will crumble. And so we need a solid substructure. Some of you right now are going through things and you're on the verge of giving up and you're on the verge of quitting. But I want to tell you, man, that God uses that to build the substructure of your life so that you'll be strong, firm, be able to handle the traffic that you're fixing to have on your life as you move forward for God. So what happens with Moses? Well, Moses talked about what he couldn't do, kind of like what we do. I can't do that. I can't do this. Exodus 3, 11 through 14, Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will surely be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, Horeb or Sinai. Verse 13, and Moses said to God, behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what's his name? What shall we say of him? Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am. And I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say to this, to the Israelites, I am who has sent you. See, God already has a plan. Moses is looking for excuses after excuse. Look at another one, Exodus 4, 1 through 3. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord will never appear to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? 
A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into the snake. Moses jumped back. Look, listen to me, guys, for a moment. This is amazing because some of us are do the same thing every day, man. We make excuses of why we shouldn't go all in. Because we look at, our, we look at the, the weaknesses of our life. We look at the, the things that we fall short of, and we think, man, well, you don't understand. I had this addiction, or I did jail time, or I did this. Or you don't understand. I'm not, I can't speak like you speak. I can't remember the Bible like you remember. Man, it has nothing to do. Every time that God calls a person, he has equipped them, and he has equipped you for your line of ministry, for your specific area that God has for you. You are equipped. Stop making excuses. And so then what we got to do is go, okay, well, if that's the case, then what's in my hand? What's in your hand? What are you hanging on to? Better yet, not what are you hanging on to. What do you need to let go of to go all in for Jesus this morning, Right? See, the staff was more than just a stick with Moses to walk with. It represented who Moses was, and that was a shepherd. It was also what he used to fight anything that came to attack the sheep. Throwing down the staff, watch this, throwing down the staff is letting go and letting God. He's giving up his identity. It represented Moses' identity and security as a shepherd. It was the way Moses made living over the last 40 years. It was his protection. So when God told Moses to throw it down, he was really asking Moses to let go of who he was and what he had. See, to go all in, it might require some of that in your life, where God's going to say, hey, let go of this so that you can grab a hold of this. It's kind of like the old, the old thing about the, the, the little uh, the monkey in the cookie jar, right? You've ever heard that? Right? The, mo- the little monkey reaches down to the cookie jar and he grabs one of them big old chocolate chip cookies, right? And he's trying to bring it out, but, but he, can't, he, he can't let it go, right? And he's afraid. There's a fear in him that if he lets go of that cookie, he won't be able to get anything. And that's the way some of us live our entire life. We're not willing to let go and go, okay, God, I'm going to push this into you because God can do more with what you have than you can. We, we talk about that, and when we talk about giving, that yes, God requires 10%. That's what he calls. But God can do more with the 90% that he gives to you than you could do with 100% in your whole life. But you've got to trust him with it. Amen? Amen? All right. I know I'm preaching good. Come on now. I'm preaching myself happy. I'm just, I don't know, man. This was Moses' all-in moment. What are you holding on to? Or should I say, what are you not willing to let go of? Because if you're not willing to let go, then you don't control whatever it is that's holding, that you're holding on to. It controls you. And if you don't throw it down, your staff will forever remain a staff. It will always be what it currently is. But if you have the courage to throw down your staff, it will become, watch this, the lightning rod of God's miraculous power. And not because you threw it down, but because of the one who will change it. God has that power to change anything and everything. Exodus 4, 13 through 16. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. And the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite, still making excuses? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak. See, it doesn't matter what you can think of, man. God will take everything, and he'll still want to fulfill his purpose in your life. But you've got to be willing to go all in. Stop being like Moses and making all these excuses, Right? God could have used Moses to speak, but man, Moses, kept, Moses, Moses had a stuttering problem. He said, okay, I'll pick your brother then. Bring him on board. Moses was still looked at what, was, what he was capable of doing instead of looking at what God could do through him. We do the same thing. We see our motivation is not about our ability. See, it's about his. See, you can be doing everything right with the wrong motive. Moses, throughout, the, throughout he was right when he killed the guards, but he did it the wrong way. Peter thought he was doing right when he rebuked Jesus and not, about going to the cross. It was the right thing. You know, he, should, he was pleading for Jesus not to go, but the way he did it and the motive of his heart was wrong, completely wrong. The final thing, man, I want you to get is this. I must surrender. I know this is a word we don't like to talk about in church, right? It's all about surrender. The word surrender is, man, it's a, it's a crazy word. And there's nothing God cannot do in and through a person who is fully surrendered to him. It's really the key verse that we're using, right? We want to do amazing things for God, but that isn't our job. I want you to get this this morning. If anything else, that's God's job. See, it's God's job to do amazing things through you, not your job to do amazing things for God. 
Stop trying so much, man. Stop, stop striving so much and be willing, man, to release this stuff and say, God, I'm giving this over to you. Our job is to fully surrender all that we have and all that we are to our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we'll do our job, God will most certainly do his. So we stand on the same 3,000-year-old promise that the nation of Israel did. And it's found in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. It says, and Joshua said to the people, watch this, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctification is a big religious word that a lot of people don't understand, but it simply means that we set something apart. When we sanctify something, it means we're setting it apart for a holy purpose, something pretty spiritual, okay? And that's what he's telling them to do. Joshua is telling the people of Israel, and I'm telling you to sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart and go all in by definition. It demands full devotion. It's dethroning yourself and enthroning Jesus. It's the complete devastation of of all self-interest. It's saying, you know what? None of that I have, I'm giving it all to him. It all belongs to him. It's giving God veto power over your life. It's surrendering all of you to all of him. It's a simple recognition that every second of time and every penny of money is a gift from God and for God. It's consecration. It's ever deepening love for Jesus Christ. It's a childlike trust in your heavenly father and a blind obedience to the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the consecration is all that and a thousand things more. But for the sake of simplicity, let me give you my personal definition of consecration. It's going all in and all out for Jesus. It doesn't mean, have you noticed that I never mentioned anything about being perfect? Having it all together. It's none of that. It's simply saying, man, I'm setting myself apart for him. I'm going to live for him. Whatever you do, do it all for his glory. It's coming to a place, man, that understanding that God wants to do amazing things in your life. It means that you're willing to burn the ships. You'll be willing to burn the ships. A few weeks, a few months ago, man, I was going through a really difficult time in my life. And I was driving out to Athens to go visit with another pastor. And on my way down there, man, I heard this song on the radio that many, I found out many have already heard this song. And I was really struggling, man. I, just a couple of nights before, I looked over at Miss Robin. I'm just going to be real transparent with you for a moment. And I said, man, am I really supposed to even be doing this thing? Am I really supposed to be doing this thing? Because, man, it seems like I'm running into this wall and I don't understand. Because we were in a really bad place in our life. Not in our marriage, but in our life. And on this road trip, man, going up to Athens, I heard this song, man, by uh, King and Country uh, called Burn the Ships. And I started listening to the lyrics, man, about turning the tide, set the sail, man, light the match, burn the ship, move on, get on with your life, forget the past. And I thought, wow, what an amazing song. I only heard part of it, so I turned the radio station. As soon as I turned the radio station, this is when God's talking to me, there it was again, the whole song starting off. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I listened to the whole song, then I pulled off to the side of the road, I pulled out my cell phone, I hooked it up to my, my car, and I found it on, uh, on the music station that I listened to, and I played it over and over and over and over and over again, until it really sunk into my spirit, that sometimes you just have to burn the ships. It's going all in means never going back. See, when you burn the ships, you can't. Matter of fact, this phrase is, is, is comes from a story from Hernan Cortez. He was setting out to, 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 for the new world of Mexico and to discover Mexico with 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, and 553 soldiers. When landing in this new world, Mexico, uh, he was going to take over it. As he landed on this place... The population of the people that were there were over 7,000 people. That's about two to one. When Heenan did not, what, what, what he did, what Cortez did was unthinkable. Once they made landfall and they got all of their supplies off the ships, he turned around and he gave the craziest order and he called his men to burn his ships because he was not going back. We were going all in. There was no retreat is what he was declaring. All the men watched the ships burn, knowing that there would be no retreat. And sometimes we're going to be faced with the decision that needs to be made, and that is no retreat decisions. We're going to burn the ships. 
No going back. Some of us, man, we hang on to the things that we want to hang on to in hopes that if we're going to go all in and that fails, then we'll go in. Rob and I had to do it. We sold our house and we moved out here to start a church that we had no idea what it would be the outcome of it. Quit my job. We went all in. And we're asking you to go all in as well. Not just as our church, but to go all in for Jesus in your life. What are you holding on to that maybe you need to turn around and burn? Now, here... Don't go home and burn your house, okay? It's not cool. I don't want to see you on the 6 o'clock news, okay? All right? We're going to buy a new car. We're burning this one. No, don't do that. Don't do that. But you need to do what Elijah did. See, Elijah was a prophet of the Old Testament, and he found another guy named Elisha plowing a field. See, God had called Elijah to follow Elijah so that he had a successor in his ministry. Elijah the prophet laid his mantle, which is like a tallit or a prayer shawl, over the shoulder. This guy's out here working the field, man, minding his own business. And the prophet Elijah, I don't know if he snuck up on him or what, but he walks up and he lays his mantle, which is a call and a purpose on his life, meaning that God was calling him into service. And look at what happens in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 21. So Elijah turns back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them, Bowled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became a servant. What he basically did, see, this is so huge because this represented who he was. It was identity. It was more than just his job. It was his livelihood. He, he plowed. He was a farmer. And in the middle of all this, man, Elijah, Elijah shows up and puts his mantle on Elijah or Elisha. And he says, okay, I'm going to follow God. And so that there's no going back, he takes the friggin' his, uh, his livelihood, the plow, he busts it up, and he brings in the oxen who pulled the plow, and he has a barbecue. And then he invites all of his homeboys and homegirls over, man, to have a, have a feast. That's one thing what I call, man, that's, that's called uh, accountability. Because now they all know you ate, you, ate your, you ate everything up, right? And now there's no going back. There's no going back. One more quick story. This is a story that's a true story of a band of brave souls who became known as the one-way missionaries a century ago. They bought tickets to the mission field with a no-return half. Instead of suitcases, watch this, they packed their very few earthly belongings into coffins. As they sailed away, they waved goodbye to everyone they loved and all that they knew, knowing they'd never return home. One survivor, a guy named A.W. Milan, was one of those missionaries. And he set sail for the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, a way that the headhunters, aware that the headhunters there had martyred every missionary before him. In other words, every person that was sent to this island was killed by these headhunters. Milan didn't fear for his life because he had already died to himself. His coffin was packed. Jesus says it this way. He says, unless a grain of seed fall to the ground and die, it can in no way produce life. We have to die to ourselves first. After 35 years, he lived among the tribe. When he died, they buried him in the middle of the village and inscribed this on his tombstone. When he came there, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Listen to me, church. It's now or never. It's all or nothing. It's time to go all in and all out for the all in all. Would you all stand here?